Welcome, and thank you for being with us for this virtual candidate forum for the Office of Mayor of the City of Encinitas. My name is Mary Crowley from the North County League of Women Voters, and I will be the moderator for this forum. We ask for uh, partnering with this forum for the, with the Lucadia Encinitas Town Council. Before we begin, I'd like to just tell you a few things about the League of Women Voters. The League is an organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. The League, <coughs> excuse me, the League, like the, 90, uh, the 19th Amendment, is celebrating its 100th year anniversary this year. And although we've been around for a long, long time, here we are staying current and tackling Zoom. Uh, speaking of Zoom, I would like to uh, acknowledge our media coordinator, League member Nancy Kelton, who has worked tirelessly to get us all up to speed. <laughs> One of the most misunderstood things about League is that although we are a political organization, we are nonpartisan. So what does that mean? That means that although we do not endorse or oppose candidates or political parties, the advocacy arm of the League will take positions on issues the League has studied. This forum is being done by the education arm of the League, which does not take positions or advocate. You know, the League of Women Voters has moderated forums like this for a long, long time. And the format they use is one that people find fair, balanced, and informative. The candidate and sponsors have all agreed to, under the, to participate under these guidelines. We're also asking the candidates to defer from any personal attacks, but rather keep to the issues of the, of the position and the campaign. Our goal is to answer as many of your questions as possible. We are recording this forum and we'll be posting it on our website. And I have to go right over to my notes to see it. Uh, it's a new YouTube channel that we have. It's called, uh, LWV North County San Diego, all one word, YouTube. I believe that the Lucadia Encinitas Town Council will also be letting folks know where they can access it. Video recorded streaming of this forum is limited to authorized entities only and must be shared in its entirety per FCC regulations. Questions for this forum have been solicited, unlike what we do when we're live, questions for this forum have been solicited in advance from the community, the league, and the town council. The question sorters have screened the questions to avoid this duplication, anything derogatory, and ones that may not be relevant to this election. They've also organized the questions into categories of similar nature to assure topics of the greatest interest are being asked within the time available. As per our protocol, the members of the team that are working on this lead, uh, on this forum, excuse me, the moderator, two question sorters, and the uh, timer uh, not, do not reside in Encinitas or participate in Encinitas election. Excuse me. And now the rules of the road. Candidates will have two minutes for the opening statement, two minutes for closing statement, and one minute to respond to each question. Um, as I reminded the uh, uh, candidates, I'd also like to share with you this is a forum, not a debate. An extra time for rebuttal is not provided. I think you're going to get sick of hearing me say this, but once again, our goal is to answer as many of your questions as possible. If there is a lightning round, those questions will be limited to yes or no answers. We will also alternate who answers each question first. The screen is for this forum. Our league members, Kathy Green and Barbara Lorenzen. Our timer is Jane Dunmire. Jane will now demonstrate how this works because although we can see it on the panel, those in the, those in the watching the recording will not be able to see her. So Jane, why don't you demonstrate the panel? Panels rather. Hi, I'm Jane Dunmeyer. I'm the timer for this forum. Um, your moderator will tell you how much time you have and I will keep, be keeping track of how much time has been spent. I will be telling you how much time you have left at 30 seconds, and I will tell you when it's time to stop. Okay, as I mentioned to the candidates, we certainly allow you to finish a sentence, but we'll ask you not to continue on. <clears throat> so, uh, well, let's begin. 
candidates, please, we've already talked about this, but just in case, silence your cell phone, mute yourself when not speaking. And although we know it can be very, very difficult, please adhere to the time constraints. As mentioned previously, this is for the office of mayor of the city of Encinitas. The term is for two years, and there are two candidates, Catherine Blake Spear and Julie Thunder. For the start of this event, the order of speaking was determined randomly, and uh, Ms. Thunder will go first now for opening statements, and then she will go last for closing statements. So Ms. Thunder, you're on. Thank you, ladies. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for providing this great service to the people of Encinitas. Encinitas has been my home for over 30 years. My husband and I are invested in Encinitas with our money, our hearts, and our time. We raised our four daughters here and someday hope to watch them raise our grandchildren here. As you can see, I have a personal stake in keeping our town safe from crime, environmental degradation, and overdevelopment. Encinitas is worth fighting for. That's why I'm running for mayor, to keep Encinitas a beach town, not a big town. Our current leadership likes to say, we're a well-run city. Well, if that's the case, why are we so tangled up in nearly 20 lawsuits, many of them a direct result of actions taken by our current council? Residents want a different future for Encinitas, and so do I. We want roads that are safe, not cluttered with so-called improvements that send cyclists to the hospital. We want our lagoons and ocean protected, not polluted by runoff from overdevelopment and shoddy infrastructure. We want a user-friendly, resident-focused city hall. We want our leaders to place public safety first. My support for law enforcement has earned me the endorsement of the Deputy Sheriff's Association. And we want managed growth. We can grow our town without destroying our town. Finally, we want to preserve the unique character of Encinitas that attracted us to live here in the first place. Thank you, and I look forward to doing the questions. Okay, Ms. Blake Spear, two minutes. Greetings, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Catherine Blake Spear, and it has really been my great honor and privilege to serve as your Encinitas mayor for the last four years. During this uncertain time, it's more important than ever that we have a mayor with a steady hand and a compassionate approach. The city of Encinitas is actually extremely well run, and I am eager to continue this on your behalf. We are a safe city, one of the safest in the county actually, and we're also financially stable. We have an unparalleled quality of life here, and one of the things that I'm most proud of are our substantial improvements to our public spaces. So we have four acres of new sand on the beach. We have the city's first quiet railroad crossing, a coastal rail trail, a new Moonlight Beach Safety Center, a new park coming to Lucadia, and many miles of new sidewalks and bike lanes. What I bring to this job as the mayor is a professional background as a practicing attorney and a former newspaper reporter. My husband and I are raising our two kids here in the same community where my mom and her three siblings were raised. I come from a family with roots here going back 100 years. My approach as your mayor is clear. I'm professional, I'm collaborative, curious, energetic, and highly responsive. I'm an environmentalist, I'm a fiscal steward who is committed to maintaining our city's financial stability. And I'm deeply committed to preserving and enhancing what makes our city so special. I believe in our ability to make life better and safer and more enjoyable and more rewarding for the people who live here. As your mayor for the last four years, I've worked hard and with distinction. I hope that our many accomplishments in the city and the conversation tonight will help make this choice for mayor clear. I'd be honored to receive your vote to continue as your Encinitas mayor. Thank you. Thanks. First question, and we'll go to you, Ms. Thunder, first. It's on affordable housing, and we did get quite a few questions on that subject. The question is, how do you plan to address the affordable housing demands made by the state? You have one minute. Oh, you're gone again. Okay. I'll be you. Okay. The demands being made by the state are a massive overreach and an attempt of this by the state to usurp our land use control. 
1986, we became a city precisely to gain control of our land use. Then in 2013, we voted for Proposition A for the exact same reason, to regain our control of our land use. And now the state is attempting to take that over. They're doing this to all the cities in the state. We happen to be carrying the brunt of it because we had to do catch up from a long time of not having a, ho a housing element. What I would do for the housing element to satisfy our affordable units requirement would be to require more, a higher percentage of developers per project. Right now, our city only requires 15%, and that will never get us to the numbers that the city, the state expects of us. So I would require higher percentages, and I would keep projects smaller and filter them throughout the city. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so I believe in uh, avoiding costly lawsuits. I think that the reality of trying to challenge the state is that my opponent would entangle us in all sorts of costly lawsuits that we have spent the last five years trying to get out of. Uh, we've already spent more than $2 million on lawsuits uh, related to housing. Um, and I think that the reality is that we are not in a position of saying yes or no to housing. What we're saying is how. And so I've worked very hard as the mayor to be responsive to the community, to be working together with people to have a plan that could be supported by residents, and then ultimately to do my job, which is to get us compliant with state law, to provide the opportunities for more housing. Our zoning actually allows for the largest percentage of affordability um, that we are legally allowed to require. So we are all in on affordable housing when it, it fits within our community. And one example of that is our accessory dwelling unit program. So that's something that scatters affordable housing into existing neighborhoods. We have been really aggressive on loosening regulations. We've tripled the number of affordable housing or of um, accessory dwelling units that we have uh, permitted in the city. And I'm really proud of that. Thank you. You'll like to have the next, first, que first question. You'll be the first one to uh, have the question next, Ms. Blakespear. It is uh, related to beach erosion. And it says there is a patchwork of seawalls and natural cliff along our eroding coastline. What will your stance be on preserving usable beach and access and beach access in districts one and two? And how will you influence what happens on our coastline? Well, it's important to notice, to note, first of all, that we had a terrible tragedy on our beach in the last year um, when the bluffs collapsed on a family. And I can't imagine what that would be like as, as a family member. And I mean, we really, uh, our hearts went out to that family that, was exper that experienced that. There really could be nothing worse. I think we, we recognize that we need to reduce the impact of the ocean on our bluffs. Um, the wave erosion is really a destructive force and bluff armoring is not allowed by the Coastal Commission. Uh, so what we need to do is um, pursue sand replenishment projects. And I'm really excited that we were able to partner effectively with our Congressman, Congressman Mike Levin. And that is uh, because of the really good partnership that I have with multiple levels of government that we're able to, to bring money here to the city of Encinitas and start a long stalled project uh, that would result in multiple years of sand being put onto our beaches. Thank you. I think the sand replenishment that's coming to Encinitas is great, and I do applaud that action to bring it, but it's not even coming to the beach that the accident happened on. So this family lost three members on a beach that we aren't even fixing, and we have not addressed the beach. All summer long, people laid against those bluffs sat and laid against the bluffs while visiting our beaches and nobody told them to get away from the bluffs. I'm sure there were many times when the lifeguards did warn people, they said they do, but the pictures came to me all summer long of unknowing families uh, set up right beneath the bluffs. So we need to do something, we need to do something very serious to fix this. Armoring may not be the right solution, but I would note that the Coastal Commission allows a homeowner to armor the wall and the bluffs in front of them once their home is in imminent danger. So I, there's plenty of things we can do before we get there with the non-native plants that are on the bluffs as well as broken irrigation. 
Uh, these need to be addressed and safety needs to be taken much more seriously. I I would, am I done? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I thought, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wrong panel. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, you will stop the next question, Ms. Sunday. What percentage of your funds for this election are from outside uh, Encinitas? Oh, a very low percentage. I, I don't know the exact number, but I have a sister-in-law and my mother that donated. And I think I got a little bit from somebody in Coronado and a little bit from somebody in San Marcos. But my donations are small. I have a lot of, almost half of my donations are under $100, 46%, that I do know. I have some large donations, but it, this is a true grassroots effort. I'm getting five and ten dollar donations from a lot of people, and then they come back and give me another five or ten the next month. And I just want them all out there to know how grateful I am for that, and how heartwarming it is to know that other people believe in me and they see what I see that we need a change in Encinitas and we need it now. Thank you, dyslexia. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, so I'm really gratified to have had close to 700 uh, people donate to my campaign. And the vast majority, I would say more than 95% live in Encinitas. Um, like my opponent, I also have family members who live out of state who have do donated. Um, but we have um, a, a tremendous outpouring of support from the residents who live in our city. And it, in Encinitas, we have a campaign contribution limit of $250. So people are donating only up to that amount. Uh, and that is a type, almost a type of campaign finance reform that we already have in our city, which is great because uh, you're, you're, we're never soliciting thousands of dollars from individual people. Um, and I, I'm grateful that we have that system here in the city. But um, yeah, I think that's the end of that answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, you'll start the next answer. Um, this is on climate change um, and the Climate Action Plan. Uh, there were quite a few questions related to this. So the question is, how do you plan to implement the city's Climate Action Plan and what more can the city do? Please be specific. Ms. Blakespear? Uh, yes, I'm very proud of our Climate Action Plan. It's something that we've won awards for uh, because it's a gold standard climate action plan and it has measurable accountability uh, within it. And what it really does is it tackles the sources of carbon emissions. So it's energy. We have moved over to a community choice energy program we're starting. It's the transportation sector. We are building bike lanes and sidewalks all throughout the city so people can get around comfortably and safely outside of their car. It's also uh, planting more trees and making our buildings more energy efficient uh, and also dealing with the waste stream. The waste stream is something that I'm excited to be working on in my next term. Uh, it's, it is uh, in partnership with EDCO, we'll be um, collecting food waste and uh, taking it to a digester so that it is no longer going to be landfilled. And, and that's a tremendous improvement for the city of Encinitas. I think that there's no question that this current group of elected officials is totally committed to our climate action plan and our environmental improvements, and it's the thing that motivates us. Thank you. Ms. Sanda? Thank you. Well, climate action, or excuse me, climate change is a real problem. The question I have, and as do others, is what can a city like Encinitas do to affect the climate change and to make our climate better? So I look at that problem in a more pragmatic, more pragmatic, realistic way. I look at uh, the, the, the stormwater that's runoff that's being diverted into the ocean and Batiquitos Lagoon. When we have heavy rains, stormwater is funneled, pumped from Lucadia over the bluffs at Beacons and just sent out without any filtering or anything. The, there's also a plan right now to create a whole new drainage system that does the exact same thing in the Batiquitos Lagoon, which will concentrate the heavy metals that are coming off the railroad tracks and dump them right into the lagoon. And that's not right. So I would like to look at things that we can do here in our town to clean up our own messes. That's where I would focus my attention. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is on COVID-19. And the question is, 
as we face the future with a possible surge in COVID cases, will you support wearing masks in all public places? And do you feel that wearing a mask is helpful in keeping Encinitas businesses open? Ms. Thunder? This pandemic, pandemic, as everyone knows, is something we've never seen before. I'm not a doctor, I'm not an MD, I'm not a county health official. So what I do and what I would do is just go by the guidelines of my county health services. On my own, I would not vote. And remember that a mayor is only a one fifth vote. I would never vote to go more or less than what the county's asking to do because the county has the experts and I would take their advice. As far as masks, I think it's clear they're helpful. I think if we all wear masks, we're gonna do a much better job of maintaining the spread of it or limiting the spread of it. But again, I, as our numbers go up and down and we never know what's gonna happen next week, I simply look forward to the day when this is behind us and none of us have to wear masks anymore. I hope it's coming. It's like this. Uh, yes, so the question about wearing masks, I mean, absolutely, I would, um, I wear them. I, I think we need to wear them. All of the credible evidence from any credible source focuses on stopping the spread through mask wearing. So that, I think that that's essentially undisputed in my mind and the county and the state are um, um, unified in saying that. Uh, the city has been really proactive in this area. We've put up hundreds of signs and banners saying wear a mask when you're in public. We've devoted public money to having our sheriff's deputies do um, education and then enforcement when needed. And we're working together with our other cities with Solana Beach and Del Mar so that we have a unified approach. Uh, taking the public health threat seriously is something that the city is very involved in. We, we have been doing that for the entirety of this uh, pandemic. And um, I would say that we have done a great job of being responsive to the community of implementing things quickly. And then even just today, we're reopening playgrounds. That's a, a, something that's been requested and we're following up on that. Thank you. Uh, the next question has to do with the cycle lanes. And this question relates to the green posts along bicycle lanes on Lucadia Boulevard. Um, and the comment is an emergency vehicle blares its horn behind your vehicle and you can't move your car into the bike lane because of the post. What do you suggest is the best way to deal with this? Ms. Blakespeare? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, so what, before we put in any street improvement, there's a public safety analysis. So the fire, the fire department is very involved in, in all of the things that happen on our public streets. And, and we, I'm sure, consulted with them before this went in. The bike lane, the protected bike lane on Lucadia Boulevard, just like the protected bike lane on Highway 101, is really important to making people feel safe for riding. When you have roads that are high speed and high volume, people don't ride their bike comfortably along those roads. And we're trying to make it easier for people to get where they want to go. We routinely hear from our residents the desire to have uh, facilities that can accommodate that, whether it's going to people's school or the market or to see their friends or the beach. And I'm really proud of, of what we've done in the city, having the bollards and the bike green bike lanes and everything that makes it more, more safe, more possible, more comfortable for people to ride their bikes. Well, I disagree. I have spoken to many cyclists who, and some well-known cyclists around here, who feel plenty safe in a painted bike lane as long as there's a good barrier painted between the cars and the bikes. Those green plastic bollards won't protect anybody if a car flies into that lane. Same with South Coast Highway 101 in Cardiff. The curbs that have been built with the alternating green plastic bollards also won't protect anybody. If a car hits those curbs, they're gonna jump right into the lane and take out whoever's there. So what both of these have done is prevent a false sense of safety. And I worry, I see in Cardiff on South Highway 101, I see mothers with kids balancing on their e-bikes, thinking they're safe driving in that lane. And it's while well, cars are going by at 45 miles per hour, it's simply not safe. It would have been safer to leave the curbs out and the bollards off. 
in my opinion. Thank you. The next question is, what specific skills and experience do you bring to the job of being mayor? Ms. Sunda? Just being someone who lives in Encinitas to start, knowing how the people are here, knowing what we cherish and value, and understanding how things move forward. Specifically, my degree in mathematics allows me to, frankly, read plans and understand statistics and studies. And my four daughters that I raised allows me to understand what the parents in our city are going through. I get it. I get what it's like to spend a lot of money to buy a house and then watch your city take the wrong direction and you have to start worrying about your house values. I get it. I know what it's like to work hard to live here and to try to make that house payment every month. So I have compassion for people that live here. Ms. Lightfield. Oh uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so I'd say in addition to being a, a parent and a resident here as well, um, I've been uh, the mayor for the last four years. And then before that I was on the Encinitas City Council for two years. And before that I was a traffic and public safety commissioner for three and a half years. Uh, so all of that involvement with the city and, and really understanding uh, what it is, how the city operates, what it is that cities do and how to do those things really well is something that I've been steeped in for many years now. I also bring the background of being a practicing attorney and um, there is no question that dealing with lawsuits is a major part of the, what the city works on. We, if we approve something, we're sued. If we oppose something and deny it, we're also sued. So it, it, it's a litigious society and um, the city is no exception in those areas. So that background has been very useful uh, as we have faced housing lawsuits and others. Um, and then also I worked as a reporter and covered government and, and so saw a lot of different governments, how they function, what they do, and that was been relevant. Okay, thank you. Um, we also have a, quite a few questions on the homeless situation. So this question is, if you had a magic wand, what would be the first thing you would do to solve Encinitas homeless issue? Ms. Lakespear? <laughs> Um, well, I'll say that the most important thing is that we protect our public spaces. So I am very concerned about that because you see what's happening in other cities and the reality that uh, people are struggling. And we live in a great city. We have very high quality public spaces and I don't want to degrade the public realm with tents or people uh, sleeping in doorways or, or anything like that. And I think it's really important that we work to prevent that. So one of the things that I've been uh, working on is the, and, and, and approved and supported and continue to support is the parking lot for 25 cars for people to stay overnight because that is homeless prevention. These are people who have lost their homes but still have a car, but they're not living on our public streets. And we all need to be working toward the solutions of of preventing homelessness and helping people who are on the street get off the street. And that requires working with the county, with the state. It is, it is not a simple solution. And it, it's easy to say, oh, just regulate it away. But that is just simply impossible. Um, thank you. Thank you. We need to address homelessness from a standpoint of compassion, as well as realistic expectations. We must start with an honest and open evaluation of our current status. Any solutions should be data-driven, comprehensive, and collaborative. We need to cooperate with our neighboring cities. We can't go this alone. Anything we solve here is just gonna spill over and create problems for them unless we all do it together. And any uh, programs that we look at must show document their proven results. With that in mind, the homeless parking lot, I would like to say, is definitely giving a place for people to stay safely. But coincidentally, we have a lot of homeless parking in our parks and in the rail corridor in both Cardiff and Lucadia. There's a woman in Coral Cove in North Lucadia who looks at that flower van that's been there for weeks or months. They've asked the city to remove it and the city doesn't. And she gets to watch the woman come out and go potty every morning in a pot. That's right on the rail corridor. And th there's a problem here that we're not admitting to. 
Okay, thank you. It, uh, the next question is um, got a long preamble to it. The state requires our city to be in compliance with housing laws. The voters passed a proposition that has resulted in the inability for the city to have a state compliant housing plan. Kind of a two part question. How would you resolve the conflict between the state and the voter mandates? And what would be the consequence of either ignoring the state and or ignoring the voters? Ms. Thunder? Well, you're talking about Prop A. And I'm not happy, happy about having my Prop A vote being reversed. We voted for Prop A under the California constitutional right for citizens to enact an initiative. And frankly, it's, offen it's offensive that it was tabled to put through this housing plan. I'm a proponent of Prop A. Other cities have it. They managed to put, out, put forth a housing plan. And I think it's not right that we set ours aside and ignored the voters in order to put in a housing plan that brought us a proposed seven-story Goodson project. Number two, when the mayor sued us over Prop A and continued to deny it, a lot of people are offended by that too. A lot of things are going wrong here. I will respect Prop A and I'll respect any vote of the people of Encinitas. Ms. Blake, uh, Yes, thank you. Uh, so I never sued any individual person. We are not, the city is not suing its residents. Um, Prop A is a really important part of our city. It, it guarantees the right to vote on upzoning. Um, and our job is also to uphold the law. So we need to have a housing plan. When a judge orders us to adopt a housing plan in 120 days, it would be wildly irresponsible for anybody in elected office to not do that, to, to defy the judge's orders. We are subject to extreme scrutiny in the city of Encinitas because of our years of conflict with the state over our housing. And I think it's really easy to be on the outside and throw stones and say, just do it differently and it'll all be better. But really the truth is there's no simple solution to this. And I support the right to vote. I also support us being compliant with state housing laws and working to do both those things at the same time is what I have been working on and will continue to work on on behalf of all residents if I'm reelected, when I'm reelected as mayor. Thank you. Uh, the next question is on planning and land use. Are you committed to the completion of the North 101 corridor revitalization plan? Ms. Blake, here. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think that's referring to Lucadia Streetscape. And that is a really important project that has been more than 10 years in the making. It will create public space that it does not exist very well right now in Lucadia. The Lucadia Highway 101 through Lucadia has turned into a cut through for people who want to avoid the congestion on the freeway. And we are starting that project around the El Portal undercross of the railroad just uh, right now, uh, we're starting that project and continuing it to the north is really important. And we're also heavily involved in improving the drainage as part of that. El Portal Undercrossing will manage a substantial additional amount of water that comes into the corridor. And as we, as we head our way north into Carlsbad, um, there, that will be improved with a thousand trees, parking in the rail corridor, continuous sidewalks, uh, wider bike lanes, roundabouts. It'll, it's going to be a beautiful improvement that I think everybody will love. Uh, Ms. Thunder. Lucadia Streetscape costs are now at $55 million. Do you know what we could do with $55 million? And do you realize how many projects will get tabled because of it? They've already tabled the North Lucadia crossing. North Lucadia has the highest fatality rate of any section along our rail corridor. Why did that one get tabled? I don't understand this and you need to ask this. For 55 million, we could build four crossings. For 55 million, we could start the studying, study to look into trenching our railroad tracks through Lucadia. We tried to do this in Cardiff, but we got railroaded by a few projects. In Lucadia, so we'll have Carlsbad to the north is trenching their tracks. They're well into the project. They haven't started construction, but it's close. Solana Beach has done it. We'll be the only city that hasn't. And it would, it would solve so many problems. It would keep people safer. It would allow us to use more of the corridor 
And in the meantime, while we're going through the lengthy process, we can do some serious upgrades to Lucadia and give the folks on the northern end a safe crossing. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question again has to do with planning and land use. With the recent approval of Fox Point and the other two developments on either side of the Quail Garden Corridor, but still being out of compliance with the state mandated housing requirements, would you rezone L7 to something higher than its current R3? And now my understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong, that the L7 is a city owned parcel near Quail Garden. So uh, Ms. Thunder? Well, L7's a tough one. It's sitting there all ready to go. But the city has a lot of properties that could be ready to go. The property near in and out is very underutilized. That, that could be high density housing and that would fit much better. It's near to transportation, it's right on the freeway and it wouldn't disturb a whole bunch of other residential neighborhoods. I think L7 should be tabled and looked at at another time, but it would solve a lot of questions, a lot of problems. Ms. Blake, here. Uh, yes. Uh, well, at fir first of all, it's important to note that none of the projects have been approved along Quail Gardens Drive. Uh, so those are projects that are making their way through the process and are at various stages, but they have not been approved. And the city needs to provide affordable housing and doing it on a piece of property that we own is something that would be under our control. I mean, none of this development, none of the development that is currently planned in the city is being um, proposed by the city because the city basically zones and doesn't build. So L7 is not on that list and it is, it is not in the plan to be developed. So it won't be. I mean, at this point, that, that's, that was the decision that was made. And it's really important to remember that our previous housing cycle, the one we just finished, had about 2,600 units in it, homes in it that needed to be zoned for. The current cycle, which is the one that I was involved in creating, has 1,500 units. So it actually has a thousand fewer units in this cycle. So L7 is not something that is in any way front of mind and is not a, a project that would be on that list right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, please explain the yard signs that say, my council is suing me, and another one that says, my mayor sued me. Ms. Blakespear? Uh, yes, well, th this was partly referenced in the la uh, question before, but um, that's th uh, another bit of fiction. Uh, I mean, if you type in your name on the court website, you will see the city is not suing you. The city is suing currently the state. So as uh, I mentioned, we are involved in a long running dispute with the state over Prop A and the right to vote and our requirements under um, state law related to housing and upzoning. So we are involved in a dispute, a legal dispute with the state. So that sign is, is wildly inaccurate. Okay, Ms. Bender. The mayor herself has said we are suing residents. Look it up. There's about 25 articles that were published around the time about Encinitas suing its residents. We are the first city ever in this state to sue its residents. Not only that, the group who created Prop A had to hire an attorney and they have bills due to that attorney. When the mayor figured out that it was not popular to be suing her residents, she changed the lawsuit to go after the state agency HCD. What she's trying to do is declaratory relief and get a judge to table Prop A. So we're back to losing our Prop A if we don't follow the, if we're not smart at this election. There's one person here who will respect Prop A and there's one who won't. And there's also one who will never sue the residents ever. Ms. Um, it, it's okay if I respond to that? Is that oh, what you're I'm, saying? I'm sorry. I, no, oh. <laughs> I, I got my, my things mixed up. Okay, I, uh, I do follow the rules, so <laughs> I, I wanted to check on that. Me. I appreciate that. Okay, I'm happy to respond and then have Ms. Thunder are, respond I, I if you want. I you not doing it. Okay, okay. Um, okay, then uh, your, the, the next question, which is, um, what type of citizens' oversight do you envision under your leadership and how do you anticipate communicating with the residents so that their voices are heard? 
Well, we have a really great uh, city commissions right now. We have eight of them. We have a youth commission, senior commission, environment commission, planning, traffic and public safety, art. Um, and this is an opportunity for people to have involvement, to make decisions, to hear from the city staff, to become involved. And that is a, a great form of engagement from residents. And also we have a, a large number of opportunities for resident engagement and participation. Of course, every meeting is always public. And then we also have surveys and do outreach and have community meetings. Um, so I feel that there is quite a lot of, of resident engagement and oversight and also, of course, we have elections to elect people to the city council. Uh, so that seems to be something that it, from, from what I see and hear and uh, compare with other cities, we have a very high level of engagement from residents. Ms. Benda? Well, for one, I would have more council meetings, not less. Over half of them were canceled at the beginning of this year for this year. Number two, I would keep my council meetings shorter so that people could come and not be stuck there till 11 or 12 at night to listen to the meeting and to have their turn to speak. Number three, I'm interested in bringing back the CABs, the community advisory boards that we had when our city was first incorporated. That was a group of five uh, people from each of our five communities that served as a go-between between between the council and the city and local residents. And I thought that worked really well. People who I've spoken to that have served on the cabs felt that they did a really good job of alerting residents when something was up in their neighborhood and vice versa and talking to the council on their behalf. Our current council members, I don't think, are doing a good job of acting as a representative to their uh, constituents within their district. So I would like to see that improved significantly. I'm happy to rebut that if you want. I don't think you've answered that question. No, I did. I started with it. <laughs> oh, I am so sorry. No, it's OK. Start, but but I'm, happy, I'm really happy to change the format. No, we can I, both... I know. I okay. know. I just like it too. But we have, to, we have to be good and go by the rules. OK. <laughs> Here's a question that I'm going to get straightened out. It's going to be Miss Thunder first, and then you're going to be second. And the question is relating to our short-term rentals. Do you believe our city housing crisis is being exasperated by the large number of Airbnbs in our city? And how do you plan to control this? I absolutely believe that it's being exasperated by the number of short-term rentals. Now there's an argument that a lot of our short-term rentals are in the higher end areas. For example, on Neptune or the view areas in Cardiff. But if, those could, if some of those could be opened up for families to rent, there would be a trickle down effect that would help our housing um, availability. The, as, as, as families moved up into the expenser rentals, it would leave other ones open. And as far as the Airbnbs, I'm, I'm not happy with the way we're, of these parties that are coming. And I'm hearing about people who live next door to homes, they get 20 people in the home renting it for a bachelor party or whatever the occasion is, and I turn it into a 24 hour party. I wouldn't appreciate living next to that and I can understand nobody would. So I think we definitely need to look at how other cities are handling this and we need to look at some ways that's fair and equitable and helps open up some of those rentals. Thank you, Ms. Blakespear. Uh, thank you, yes. So enforcement and compliance is really key. Uh, we need to have a proactive approach, and we do. Uh, any public nuisance needs to be addressed, and that's uh, really important for maintaining our neighborhoods. We, we have a group called Host Compliance that we use to make sure that anybody who is renting their, their, our, their b and is um, registered with the city, is paying the fee, is paying the hotel tax, the transient occupancy tax, which is 10%. And, and that's been a really good improvement in the last year or so that we have been using that uh, because it makes it, it makes it so that nothing is falling through the cracks. Uh, but I agree that it's really important we maintain our neighborhoods. You know, our our accessory dwelling units, our granny flats are not available to be rented because they have 
as Airbnbs because they have to be rented for at least 30 days. So this is a way for us to make sure that vacation rentals aren't what people are building uh, within the existing neighborhoods. And I think that's a, an important protection that, that those of us in elected office really pressed for and made sure was part of the ordinance when it passed. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is about policing issues. And it says, what do you think about the current sheriff's funding and its programs and services? Ms. Blakespear? Um, there's a lot of information right now about law enforcement. And I'll say that I'm really glad that we in the city of Encinitas do not have a lot of unrest related to that. There are some cities that are really struggling as we know. Um, for good reason, uh, but in Encinitas, we pay about $16 million for our sheriff contract and about the same for our fire and marine safety, which means that overall our public safety budget is about half of our general fund revenue, which is uh, a, not such a bad percentage. I mean, we, we have a lot of um, needs and desires in terms of having deputies in the city. And we need to make sure that, of course, racial justice issues are top of mind. And that's something that I was involved in uh, planning a forum with the sheriff and then also a summit with all the other cities. There are nine other cities that contract with the sheriff in this county. And we all had a meeting with the sheriff and, and the cities to talk about racial justice issues. Uh, so I think it's important that we're committed to continuous improvement and, and that we hold them accountable and that we are always making sure that we get what we need. Thank you. Ms. Sanda. Well, again, as I said in the beginning, I'm endorsed by the Deputy Sheriff's Association, and I take that very seriously. They recognize that I value law enforcement, and they recognize that I think we need to do a better job with our law enforcement in Encinitas. And I don't mean the deputies, nor do I mean the sheriff's captain, but the um, Captain Taft. We have a markedly increased crime in Encinitas right now, and that needs to be addressed. It's a puzzle to me why it's not being addressed, but we have things happening every day. We have drug busts going on in four of the hotels that are housing our homeless. We recently, just a few nights ago, had a rape on Moonlight Beach. We had a homeless person start a fire at Swami's. We have uh, people using our streets as bathrooms. We definitely need a little cleanup here. And if anything, I think I would consider hiring more deputies to help us clean this up, or possibly maybe just enforcing the codes that are being ignored right now. Hopefully that would be enough. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This will be our last question, and I'm going to allow it for two minutes, if you'd like that time. Uh, so the question is, in this time of limited budgets and resources, what will your top three priorities be? And Jane, I don't know if you heard me, it's gonna be a two minute question, two minute answers. So what will your top three priorities be, Ms. Sanda? Well, I'd look right into uh, Lucadia and what we can do there without spending the 55 million. I think a lot of attention needs to go into Northern, Northwest Lucadia. They've been neglected for far too long. They've suffered through multiple councils who have done nothing but add more to the project of Lucadia streetscape. And I'd also like to look at a serious hard look if the people of this city want to take a hard look at trenching those railroad tracks so we can recover the space in the corridor. Something else I'm passionate about is solving our homeless problem. And we do have a problem with the homeless right now. It is definitely blossomed. And it seems to people who live downtown and go downtown a lot that we're not doing anything to address that. So that would be for me. Okay, Ms. Lakespear. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, so we have a lot of infrastructure improvements that are really important to our community. Lucadia Streetscape is one of them, but, but there, there are many. Um, we, are, we also need to do a crossing in Northern Lucadia as was referred to, and we're actually going out for a request for proposals in January for that. So that is something that is planned, that we are uh, looking forward to. We have a large number of road improvement projects um, to make it safer and easier to get around in your car and outside of your car. We also have Pacific View, which needs to be activated. It's a really important part of our community that has great potential. Uh, and I'm um, looking forward to, to activating that site. 
Um, and then we have the homelessness is something that we also need to focus on. And our climate action plan is really important, as was mentioned earlier. And we will be uh, moving forward with many environmental initiatives as well. Uh, so I think that the question is, there, a question always comes up of, do we want to have more affordable housing in this city? Because if we did, we could also put more money into it. Because right now, as I said before, we do not build, we zone. And having more affordable housing would be something that would be a community good. It would allow people who work in this community to live in this community. It would allow your kids as they grow up. It would allow you as you age and, um, the, the many people who work here and can't afford to live here to have a home in Encinitas. So that's something I think we also need to be talking about as uh, we move forward uh, when we're looking at our budgets. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Be before our candidates give their closing remarks, I want to first thank you for asking such good questions. It's obvious there's a lot of interest in this election and we had almost 100 questions. Uh, by the way, if you'd like to get involved in the, with the men and women making democracy work for everyone, it's really, really easy to join the league. We encourage you to visit our website, my.lwv.org, and then click on North County. We also encourage you to visit votersedge.com. I'm telling you, this is your number one website. It's got everything. It's a one-stop shopping, it's nonpartisan, and it gives very, very detailed information about the candidate, battle, uh, ballot issues, and detailed voting information. The website also tracks the financing of the ballot measures, which as we all know, can be very, very informative. The San Diego Registrar's website, sdvote.com, is another great resource for getting additional information about the election. And by putting your address in, you can access your personal ballot. You can also, I think this is something that they've just started this year, you can also track your mail-in ballot. If you go to the website on the home page, there's a section called Where's My Ballot? It's like tracking your FedEx package. It can tell you exactly where your mail-in ballot is from start to finish. So it's just another way to gain confidence in the mail-in ballot system. Also, if you really, really, really can't wait, you wait early voting at the registrar's office starts on October 5th. <clears throat> it's easy, secure, and, and convenient to vote by mail. So now the candidates will make their closing statement of two minutes and reverse the order. So we begin with you, Ms. Blake Spear. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I wanna say thank you for, for listening and participating. Uh, just a couple things I want to highlight. So one is my endorsements. Um, because of my environmental and public safety commitments, I am uh, proud to be endorsed by the Sierra Club, the League of Conservation Voters, Climate Defenders, and the Encinitas Firefighters Association, as well as Run Women Run and Planned Parenthood and the Democratic Party and many, many others. Um, and I also just want to say a couple words about things that I didn't get a chance to respond to, but it is just patently untrue that crime is going up in the city. Encinitas is one of the safest cities. It remains that way. We do not have increased crime. We also don't make individual decisions about the railroad. As you can em envision, this is a regional facility and there, there is a North County Transit District and we don't get to say we want to lower the tracks. Um, we also do not have fewer meetings than other cities. Most cities meet twice a month. We meet three times a month. So we are already, just by our normal schedule, having more meetings than other cities. Um, and also, council meetings are long because people participate. You know, that's something that's important to me. And we stay because we want to hear what people are saying. And I very rarely limit public speaking time. Uh, so thank you for being interested in this. I think that uh, my experience, demonstrated experience at the city, uh, my attitude, my engagement with you um, have demonstrated that I'm the right choice to continue as your Encinitas mayor. And I thank you very much for your support. Ms. Linda, two minutes. Thank you, ladies. I'm fiercely committed to preserving the unique identities of our communities. Today, state housing policy and the refusal of our mayor to push back threatens the community character we hold so dear. Yes, we need affordable units, but my opponent and I differ on approaches. 
My opponent says, quote, in order to slow down climate change, we must densify the coastline. Do we really need to spoil Encinitas to save the planet? No. We can demand that developers set aside a higher percentage of their projects for low income housing. That will get us closer to state requirements much faster. But the mayor, who is supported by developers, refuses to do that. Her campaign's financial records show contributions from at least eight developers. Some of them benefited directly from her reversal of our Measure U vote. Some of them see dollar signs from upzoning that the mayor supports. Follow the money. Two developers donated $9,000 each to a PAC dedicated to reelecting this mayor and two of her colleagues. This PAC is a classic end run around our $250 limit on individual donations. Ask yourself, why is it so important for these high dollar donors to keep a developer friendly mayor in office? Have you ever given that much money to a local campaign? And the folks, excuse me, folks, this is a David versus Goliath fight. My opponent has big money behind her, but I have a grassroots movement that is awakened to the truth. And that truth is that it's time for reason and logic to drive our decisions, not ideology and partisan pressure. As an independent, I'm not beholden to special interests. The only interests I care about are those of the residents of Encinitas. Please vote for change of selection by electing me, Julie Thunder, for mayor. Thank you. Thank you. On, on behalf of the Lacadia Encinitas Town Council and the League of Women Voters of North County, San Diego, I want to commend the candidates for running for elected office and for their participation in this forum. And I want to thank you, the viewing audience, for wanting to be involved and not just being a voter, but an informed voter. So thank you very much for joining us.